Sean is a 23-year-old student I know who lives in Footscray in inner Melbourne. He rides his bike to uni, which gets him there quicker than a car in Melbourne's traffic. He catches the train to the pub with his mates and he gets it home again without having to worry about how much he's had to drink. Sean is one of the lucky ones who has the choice not to get his driver's licence. On the other side of town, 18-year-old Sylvia lives in Cranbourne South with her family and is in her final year at high school. She wants to study engineering next year. She can do that at a TAFE college in Dandenong or Frankston. It would take her 15 minutes to drive to Frankston or 45 minutes by bus. After getting someone to drive her to her closest bus stop three kilometres away. If she chose to go to study in Dandenong, it would take her 25 minutes in her car. But if she wanted to take public transport, she would have to take a bus, then a train, then another bus, and it would take well over an hour. For Sylvia, there is no real choice. So it's her number one aim at the moment is to get her driver's licence. Her parents are going to buy her a car so that they don't need to keep driving her everywhere. It will be the fourth car in the family. Her elder brother uses his every day to drive to Monash Uni at Clayton. It would take him an hour and a half to get there by public transport. The freeway he drives on is packed each and every morning, as are the roads getting on and off. And the pressure continues for more lanes and upgraded arterial roads at the most congested pinch points. We can give the millions of people like Sylvia and her family a choice. We can go down the tired old route of pumping more and more money into tollways and motorways that encourage more people to jump in their cars, pump out more pollution and increasing the congestion it's meant to solve. Or we could be prioritising the kind of transformative in trans transport we need to bring us out of the kind of 20th century thinking that we've come to expect from this government. Toll roads and motorways are in extraordinarily expensive. Melbourne's east-west link was estimated to cost $18 billion. That's $1 billion per kilometre. $1 million per metre. Let's put that in perspective. In Victoria, the average infrastructure spend each year is only two to four billion. $18 billion would go a very long way to build virtually every heavy rail project proposed in Melbourne. Airport rail, Doncaster rail, Roville rail, the Metro rail tunnel. We can't afford to spend such huge amounts of money on roads we don't need, which won't solve our congestion problems. Put simply, if you build satisfactory networks of trains, trams and buses, so as many people as possible have the choice to travel by fast, frequent, reliable, affordable and safe public transport, then people will use it. If you build it, they will come. We don't need everyone to use public transport, just a better balance. And the bit of the equation which the road lobby seems to ignore is that every person travelling by foot, bike or public transport means one less car on the road. Forget more and more roads. This is the best thing we can be doing to be reducing congestion. The benefits of encouraging alternatives to cars do not stop at economic or congestion-busting reasons. The health benefits of walking, cycling and public transport are enormous. Last year, around 16,000 Australians died due to inactivity. 16,000. The Heart Foundation is clear about the benefits of more exercise. In their report, Move It! Australia's Healthy Transport Options, they outline very starkly that low levels of physical activity are a major risk factor for ill health and mortality from all causes. People who do not do sufficient physical activity have a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, colon and breast cancers, type 2 diabetes and osteoporosis. Being physically active improves mental and musculoskeletal health and reduces other risk factors such as overweight, high blood pressure and high blood cholesterol. And being physically inactive can take three to five years off your life. We need to be doing everything we can to make it easier 
for people to get the 30 minutes of exercise they need five times a week to lead healthy lives. And the easiest way for us to get enough exercise in our busy daily lives is to include it in our daily commute. Travelling by car does not do that. Travelling by public transport usually does. And walking and cycling, of course, always does. This is crucial in tackling childhood obesity as well. The past few decades have seen a dramatic decline in children riding to school. Currently, a whopping 62 per cent of kids are driven to school, and a mere 8 per cent ride their bikes. This is their parents' choice. And if we had more up, if we had up to scratch infrastructure, more than half of parents indicate they would let their kids ride or walk to school. The investment I'm talking about has the support of the public. According to a report released last week, 71 per cent of people support more funding for cycling, walking and public transport infrastructure. Of course we need to keep the roads we've got up to scratch, but we also have to make up for the decades of underinvestment in public transport. We need affirmative action for our train, tram and bus networks to give people a real choice based on assessment of need, social, environmental and economic need, including tackling climate change. Infrastructure Australia know this. Their National Infrastructure Plan states that public investment in urban transport should focus on public transport. But we know where the government stands with their roads, roads, roads agenda. And Labor is trying to have a bob each way too. They are still committed to spending billions on the WestConnex motorway in Sydney. But this ignores the desperate lack of choice faced by Australian commuters every day. We need to get away from this outdated thinking that federal transport funding should be just about roads. Yet now we see that Labor has done a deal with the government on the fuel excise indexation that does nothing to address this. The Abbott government has been holding the parliament to ransom with the fuel excise, threatening to hand taxpayers' money over to the oil companies if the Senate wouldn't pass the legislation. And so, as we've just seen this morning, Labor caved in. A good result would have seen two outcomes for some of this money to go to public transport. If you're going to make people pay more to drive, you've got to give them alternatives and to compensate the least well-off who will be most impacted by this tax increase. Joe Hockey was wrong. People on low incomes do drive cars, and they often have to drive the furthest because they don't have any other choice. The Greens were negotiating to see if we could get a good outcome for people, and it's the people that have lost out because of this deal between Tony Abbott and the Labor Party. This deal fails to cut pollution and fails to compensate the least well-off. Roads to Recovery is a good program, but we have now lost the opportunity to force the government into action on public transport. We have regional communities whose existing train services are broken. This money could have helped provide decent rail services to communities like Albury and Newcastle. And we could have had a massive improvement on people's public transport choices with a relatively modest investment in buses in outer suburban and regional communities. The fact is that investing in walking, cycling and public transport infrastructure makes sense. After this year's federal budget continued the government's ideological aversion to anything that's not a road, containing no new funding for public transport, I held a forum in Melbourne to discuss what's next to get our transport system back on track. I asked people to send a message to this government, and I want to leave you with some of these messages. Mm. Nick referred to the Prime Minister's thoughts that there aren't enough people to justify any vehicle larger than a car. He urges Prime Minister Abbott to have a look at bus route 902 towards Nunawading in the morning peak. Jim said, cars are so last millennium. We have to shift from carbon to renewables and stop choking our cities with motor vehicles. And Jen's message summed it up. Don't turn Melbourne into LA. Cars and road building are band-aids. Please invest in public transport. My kids and my future grandkids matter. I urge the government to take note of these messages and give Australians the transport they deserve.